Hey, History Seekin here, and today we'll take a walking tour of Knaresborough Castle in North Yorkshire. The remains of the castle we see today date from around the 14th century and was an administrative and important military fortress. The land was owned by the Crown since Norman times. The castle was a royal residence for Queen Philippa, which was part of a marriage settlement with her husband, King Edward III in 1331. In 1648, demolition had commenced and the castle was blown up. The ruins we see today are the result of dismantling. The castle is now open to the public for a small charge. In a stunning cliff-top location, towering over the River Nid, stands Knaresborough Castle, once the mighty stronghold of medieval kings. Originally built on the site 900 years ago and remaining a royal castle to this day, King John, Edward I and II, lavished money to create one of the North's most impressive castles. For centuries, the castle was an important military fortress, situated strategically within the rural forest of Knaresborough. In addition, it served as a hub for the surrounding community, a refuge in times of danger and a centre for government and justice. These are the remains of the solid half-round towers of the East Gate, which are slotted where a heavy wooden portcullis gate would have defended the entrance. Little is known about the castle's origin, but it is possible that there was some sort of fortification in Anglo-Saxon times, they are perhaps a clue in the first mention of Knaresborough in the Doomsday Book of 1086, when it was called Chesderburg. Burg is an old English word for a defended enclosure and we refer to a bank and ditch surrounding a settlement here. The castle was protected by a massive dry moat or ditch, which surrounded the castle on two sides, continuing round and through what is now the car park. One of Knaresborough's castle's most unusual features is the Sally Port. This hidden tunnel was used for secret entry and exit to the castle. It was large enough for a small group of armed men to leave the castle quietly at night and launch an attack on any besieging troops. Built in the late 13th or 14th century, it is cut out of the solid rock and slopes steeply down to the level of the bottom of the dry moat or ditch. Where there is an exit, its entrance was likely to have been hidden by a slab in the stone floor of a building, 
known only to a trusted few. In its heyday, the castle resembled a small town with many buildings, surrounded by a high, thick wall. The enclosure was split into two areas, known as the inner and outer wards. The castle's huge gateways opened onto the outer ward, bustling with daily activities that supported the life of the castle, such as milling, brewing, baking and smelting. The earliest castle in this site was established after the Norman Conquest. The first written reference dates from the reign of Henry I from 1100 to 1135, when financial records, the pipe rolls, show that £11 was spent in 1129 to 1130 on strengthening the King's works at Knaresborough by custodian Euston Fitz John. In front of us are the remains of a delicately vaulted porch, giving access to an external staircase. This staircase was fortified with several portcullises, as well as murder holes for dropping missiles. Some years later, the castle played a part in one of the most infamous stories of the medieval period. In 1170, the constable of Knaresborough Castle, Hugh de Morill, and his followers took refuge there after they had murdered Thomas Becket, Archbishop of Canterbury. For the next 500 years, there were significant periods of building and repair work at the castle and was adapted to meet changing requirements, fashion and historic events. At the heart of the inner ward was the royal residence, the King's Tower. It was the most important building in the castle, where the Lord of the Manor met his important visitors, where most of the business of the court was done. 
built on the foundations of an earlier keep. The tower was constructed between 1307 and 1312, under the direction of King Edward II, who took a keen interest in the progress of this palatial residence. When monks from St Mary's Abbey in York decided to find their own establishment, they chose a site near Ripon not too far from the Forest of Knaresborough. That first winter of 1132-1133 was harsh, and the monks were near starvation. Euston, Fitz John, Constable of Knaresborough Castle, helped them survive by sending a cartload of bread. The King's Tower was a strongly fortified but comfortable residence. Accounts show that the present tower was built around 1300, and King Edward II took a keen interest in the building work. The constable of the castle, appointed to run the castle for the King, had chambers on the ground floor. The main chamber on the first floor had four rooms leading off it, including the guard robe or toilet, which still has its original toilet shaft. The first floor was the King's Chamber, or the King's Hall. At one end was a raised day, with a throne niche. To one side was a large window with detailed tracery. The room was lined on either side, with low stone benches. A spiral stair connected this grand interior to a bedchamber. Opening off it was a small chapel above the entrance lobby of the tower, and this is where the portcullis, control of the entrance, was operated from. The foundations of an earlier tower was found during excavations in 1990. In this earlier tower in 1210, the first royal Maundany took place, where King John gave clothes, forks and food to the poor. Today the present monarch gives coins in a leather purse to deserving people on the Thursday before Good Friday, which is known as Maundy Thursday. The lowest level of the tower was a dungeon accessed by an external staircase. This was a secure place for storing supplies, but also served as a prison in later times. The dungeon's central column with rib vaults is very unusual.
in the late 1500s, Sir Henry Slingsby, the constable and surveyor of the castle, had this courtroom built above the existing ground floor level. It is very unusual to have survived so long. A special court was held here to ensure the rules of the Honour of Knaresborough was kept. The Honour of Knaresborough was a great royal estate, formed after the Norman Conquest. It had three parts, the forest, the liberty and the borough. Every three weeks on a Wednesday, a court met to deal with minor disputes and tenancy transfers. Minor criminals and offenders against forest rules were tried at Easter and the autumn at special sessions. Common forest offences included cutting the branches of evergreens, such as holly, to feed the cattle and sheep in winter, taking acorns and apples, illegal hunting and milking of neighbours' cows when they are out onto common land to pasture in the summer. Fines ranged from one to five shillings. Attendance at these courts were compulsory, for all tenants and absentees were fined. Most of the serious criminal cases were tried in York. The court proceedings were written on court rolls made of parchment tacked together. The earliest surviving parchment roll dates to the reign of Edward III in 1333 and the latest to the reign of Queen Anne in 1707. By the beginning of the 19th century, the honour of Knaresborough Court no longer played an important part in the government of the area and was little more than a land register for copyhold property. The courts were held in the Borough Courthouse, and this courthouse building became a solicitor's office. These stocks originally stood in the castle grounds, near the iron gates opposite the site of the present police station. They were used to punish minor offenders who had to sit and suffer the jeers of passers-by who were encouraged to throw things such as rotten eggs or mouldy fruit and vegetables at them. Constables were appointed annually at the Michael Mass Grand Court Leet, one for each township in the Forest and Liberty and two for the borough. This baton is inscribed Edward Barr, Constable of Knaresborough from 1827. Edward Barr was re-elected twice. Many carved architectural fragments and a stone coffin were excavated from the church and the priory site in the 1860s, along with an elaborate stone inscription. They were moved to Knaresborough Castle by the Slingsby family, who owned the priory site. Some were on show in the King's Tower, and some were built into the wall outside it. On the capitals on display here, you can see the mason's mark from the 13th century, these marks help the mason with the correct setting out of the stone.
This prison door is one of two doors removed from the former cells in the 1786 prison building. This building adjoins the courthouse across a small yard. It was converted to be part of a caretaker's house early in the last century when the yard was covered over. The iron hatch in the centre of the door was used to allow food and drink to be passed through to the prisoners and to allow observation without opening the door. This small engine was made by Phillips, Surrey side of Blackfriars Bridge, London. The date of 1774 may have been a later addition, but the engine would have been made around then. Engines like this had to be pushed or carried to the fire and supplied with water by a wired leather suction hose and or buckets. Several men were needed to ply the pump handles, while another directed the jet either from a fixed brass gooseneck on top of the engine or from a separate metal branch pipe supplied through a leather hose. Guy Fawkes 1570 to 1606 Connection to Knaresborough dates back to the period of his life spent in the nearby village of Scotton. Born in York and educated at St Peter's School he grew up in a strict Protestant but after his father's death, his mother married Dennis Bainbridge, a Roman Catholic, who lived in Scotton Old Hall as a resident agent. Guy came to live here in his late teens and became a convert to the Catholic faith. Fawkes was by profession a soldier. In 1592, he sold the small estate in Clifton, which he inherited from his father and went to fight for the armies of Catholic Spain in the Low Countries. He was by all accounts conscientious and brave. Now an expert on explosives, he was recruited by the conspirators to stack the famous 56 barrels of gunpowder in the vaults of the House of Lords. His failure to blow up James I on the 5th of November 1605 is celebrated every year on Guy Fawkes Night. However, traditionally, no guy is burnt on Scotton's bonfire. Mother Shipton, from 1486 to 1561, was a legendary prophetess and witch. Her name first appears in a print in 1641 publication, The Prophecy of Mother Shipton in the Reign of King Henry VIII. It describes her as a woman living in Tudor York and reaccounts her prediction of the death of the Cardinal Wolsey in 1530. It also contains a prophecy describing a ship sailing up the Thames and finding that London had been devastated. This was believed to predict the Fire of London of 1666, as referred to in the Diary of Samuel Pades, 20th of October 1666.
I am to die for being an honest man, of which I am very glad, but sorry that it was not for some more effectual service to His Majesty. These are the last words of Sir Henry Slingsby before he went to the scaffold in 1658, and this is the linen shirt that he wore when he was beheaded on Tower Hill on June the 8th, 1658. Sir Henry was executed for treason against the protector Oliver Cromwell, accused of plotting the return of King Charles II. He was one of the last royalists to be executed. The helmet, backplate, spurs and sword are all from the 17th century. The gorget, a form of neck guard, is from the 1600s. And the cannonballs were found during archaeological excavation on the castle during the 1920s. The stone balls were found at the Sally Port when it first reopened in the 1890s. The lead musket balls were also found during excavation in the area of the North Gate. The gauntlets are from 1520 to 1530, earlier than the Civil War period. Raised work casket top from the 17th century. Stump work is worked mainly in tiny beads of silk. It shows Charles II and his wife Catherine. It was probably worked during the 1660s, after the restoration of Charles II to the throne. The purse in the form of a bird was mid-17th century. And the Book of Psalms from 1627. In the display case is a pewter plate, a left-handed bowl from the 17th century with yellow glaze inside, a pipkin from the 16th or 17th century with a foot missing, a tinderbox, a salt glazed stoneware flagon, a wooden trancher from the early 17th century, an 18th century knife with a curved tip, a wooden screw type nutcracker, a lot of pottery fragments, and a leather jug from the 17th century. In 1204, King John took possession of the castle and the forest of Knaresborough, gaining a base for his favourite sport of hunting, also a stronghold ideally situated for helping to control the rebellious barons in the north of England. Records show that between 1204 and 1216, King John spent £1,290 to turn Knaresborough Castle into a military fortress including the excavation of the dry moat. The castle also developed as a munition centre. Its forgers were one of the country's most important manufacturers of quarrels or crossbow bolts. A view from the castle. 
looking over the River Nid. For King John, Knaresborough Castle was an important northern bastion during the Barons' Revolt of 1215 to 1216, triggered largely by John's refusal to adhere to the Magna Carta signed in June 1215. The castle was on high security alert. £100 was spent by the constable of the castle, Brian de Lees, on siege engines and other defences to ensure that Knaresborough Castle remained strongly loyal to King John. There is some debate as to what this large stone trough was actually used for. It was found on the site of the Priory down by the riverside and is thought to have been brought up here by the Victorians, along with all the other Priory stone they took. There are examples in the buttery and the walls surrounding the entrance to the dungeon. The channel and headrest in the base imply a body shaped and therefore perhaps a coffin. But if this is so, where is the deceased? These stone fragments were excavated in the 19th century from the medieval priory. The priory lay beside the River Nid, near where what is now Abbey Road. Nothing above ground remains of the priory buildings. You can still see fragments of stonework built into the post-medieval walls along Abbey Road. For example, near the lock gate, which blocks the road. Edward II's reign descended into chaos, with friction between powerful factions and ever-increasing raids by the Scots into northern England. Unrest led to rebellion against the King, and in 1317, Knaresborough Castle saw military action, when it was seized by supporters of the Earl of Lancaster. The King's constable spent £55 to lay siege and eventually recaptured the castle three months later. In 1318, 
raiding Scots penetrated as far south as Knaresborough and burnt much of the town, including the parish church and priory. Knaresborough Castle, though, was not taken and remained the only point of refuge in the town. On the first floor, the King's Chamber was the centre of power in the castle. It was richly decorated to create a sense of awe and to show off the castle's authority and wealth. The King would be seated on a raised stone day before the decorative arch at the end of the chamber with a fire roaring in the fireplace and light streaming through a large stained glass window surrounded by courtiers in attendance. The redevelopment of Knaresborough Castle clearly demonstrated a new trend in castle architecture towards comfort, elegance and the display of prestige and power. Court documents refer to building work to the White Tower, the Great Hall, the Great Chamber, the Great Chapel, the Chapel of St Thomas and the Great Gate, giving us a tantalising glimpse of the scale of the castle at this time. Following the death of Edward I in 1307, the rebuilding work was completed under his son, King Edward II, at the grand cost of £2,174. He oversaw the construction of a magnificent new keep, known ever since as the King's Tower. Stained glass was expensive in medieval times. The large windows in the King's Tower show that Knaresborough was a very rich castle. Shortly after inheriting the throne, Edward II granted the honour and castle of Knaresborough to his favourite, the nobleman Piers Gaveston from 1284 to 1312 and built the impressive King's Tower as a luxury residence for him. Hated by the other barons, Gaveston was felt to have too much influence over the King. Opposition mounted and Edward was in residence at Knaresborough in 1312 when Gaveston was besieged at Scarborough Castle. On his way to trial, Gaveston was abducted and murdered. A spiral stairway led to the second floor. Very little remains of this level, but it probably contained the solar, the Lord and Lady's own chambers and a private chapel. Early 14th century castle records show that the building of the King's Tower involved a large number of craftsmen and labourers. The Master Mason was in overall charge 
and a team of Freemasons and journeymen cut the stone and built the walls and foundations of the tower. Stone was cut by hewers at the quarry, then carted to the site. They used simple pulley systems to move the stone. Mason used tools such as squares, dividers and scorers to mark the stone and hammers, mallets and chisels to cut and shape it. Sometimes the masons marked the stones with their own mason marks. Lime burners made mortar to bond the stones together from a mixture of sand, quicklime and water. A team of carpenters made the wooden scaffolding, cut the timbers for floors and roof beams and made the doors and furniture. Smiths, plasterers and tilers would have also been involved in the building of the castle. Blacksmiths made nails and iron fittings for locks and doors. A small team of glass cutters and glass painters made the windows for the towers and chapels. Plumbers were craftsmen who worked with lead making strips to hold the stained glass in the windows, as well as lead used on the roof and water pipes. The lowest level of the tower is a cellar, known as the dungeon. In medieval times, it was a secure place to store the supplies, required when the lord or lady of the manor came to visit. The constant low temperature meant it was an effective fridge. The dungeon's central column, with 12 rib vaults, is unique in Britain. By the 16th century, this area served as a prison.
Thank you all for watching. We do appreciate it. If you enjoy our videos, please consider subscribing. Put on the bell for the notification. Do take care and have a fantastic week ahead.